And uh, we are going to make our last session in this hall for today. I said not last. The last session is going to be ours for closing. Yes, but last session, which is, has something reasonable to tell you. And, uh, well, really happy to see that this session has so many interesting words like E2E, CI. <laughs> Spring Boot, of course. Yes, without Spring Boot, it won't go. And, of course, uh, test containers. So I think it's going to be really awesome. So please welcome Simeon. Now, the stage is yours. Thank you. So, Dobro Vecher, Bulgaria, Sofia. <laughs> uh, like uh, Mita said, I have collected all uh, feature words in my title, so I expected <laughs> a lot of people to come and see my talk. You know, it's also an additional responsibility when your talk is closed in the conference, and I hope you like uh, what I'm going to tell you right now. So, the topic is E2E testing in CI environment with test containers usage. And first, a few words about myself. My name is Simon. I am Java developer and uh, Java team lead at MTS Digital of Big Data Department. For those of you who don't know, MTS is one of the biggest uh, telecommunication company in Russia. And also, I write technical articles on Dev2. You can go to this link after, um, after my talk and um, see what I write here, mostly about Spring Boot testing and Java. Also, you can find my um, links down there, LinkedIn, Twitter, Telegram, and so on. By the way, there will be a lot of links during this uh, talk. You don't have to memorize all this stuff because the last slide contains QR code. You can scan it, download slides, and um, see whatever you like later. So what's the plan of the talk? Uh, firstly, I'm going to quickly um, explain to you the difference between unit integration and N2E, uh, E2E tests, their purpose and differences. Also, why do we need E2E tests in general in the first place? What are the automation strategies to run E2E tests? And, of course, there will be a lot of code examples, tests themselves, plus tuned GitHub Actions pipeline. And also, the entire code is available by this link. You can check it out later and see how it works in real life. Part one, unit, integration, and E2E test. So what are these cases? But firstly, let's quickly discuss the system I'm going to explain you through the entire talk. Uh, it's not that complicated, so the whole idea, we have some REST API and API service that accepts a request, uh, HTTP request, and then API service pushes messages to some message broker. Um, a small disclaimer, I'm not advocating for any specific technologies during this talk. It could be RabbitMQ, Kafka, Apache Pulsar, doesn't matter. It's just some message broker. Then there is a gain service that consumes messages from uh, RabbitMQ. And then, depending on the content of a retrieved message, there are several options. We can either update gaining data in uh, Redis for future um, uh, enhancements, or we can just get some data by key and enhance the message and push it back to RabbitMQ. So I think this is more or less clear. Not so complicated design, two microservices, uh, a message broker, and a cache. So that's basically it. Unit testing can be described like this. So look at this purple and um, green ovals. Uh, they cover only services themselves. Uh, by the way, I'm asking the first row, what are the benefits of unit testing, do you think? What can you name? What are the benefits? Well, yeah, unit tests in general. So, well, I think they're easy to write. Easy to write. Okay. Yeah, easy to implement. Easy to run in parallel. And uh, if you hire, for example, a junior developer, then most likely they're aware what is unit test. You don't have to explain all this scenario uh, from scratch. And, well, unit testing has have a lot of advantages. But the main disadvantage of unit test is that we don't check the actual interaction. Because if you deploy something, no matter what environment it is, development, staging, production, you do not deploy it and assuming, oh, there will be no RabbitMQ, no <laughs> database, just some uh, stuff. No, it's not, uh, it's not happening in real life. And we need to validate those behaviors somehow, and that's why we have integration tests as well. Thankfully, test containers made integration tests easy like a pie, and you see those ovals uh, has become, uh, have become uh, bigger. So now we have 
uh, the service itself and its direct dependencies. So API service with RabbitMQ and gain service with RabbitMQ and Redis. Seems like that's enough. So we have unit tests, we have integration tests. What else do we need to check that uh, the entire system is working? Actually, if you have only integration tests, that there are still some um, an anomalies that can occur in your system. For example, uh, I will name it validating backward compatibility. Producers send message with the wrong format and consumer could not just realize it. So that's a very common problem in distributed environments because you send something and the, the consumer could not just realize it. Your whole system doesn't work, even if both consumer and producer have integration tests. I know that there are some approaches to overcome this issue. You can put your schemas in separate repository, you can version them, you can test them, but Still, this situation happens. Sometimes you have to deal with them somehow. A client sends request to an existing REST endpoint. Well, for example, there are two separate teams, and one developed some REST endpoint, and you just call it. You are another team. And another team has decided, OK, this REST endpoint is deprecated, so we can just eliminate this one. We wait for like a month, and that's OK. On the contrary, your team, your team lead has gone to vacation, or he or she just forgotten that <laughs> this endpoint has been invoked somewhere, and again, your entire system doesn't work. So you may have seen these funny pictures on the internet. So many unit tests, no integration tests. I think when we are talking about this distributed system, this could be altered a bit. So you have many integration tests and no e tests at all, because each part of your system is working indistinct, but when you combine together, well, boom, boom, nothing works fine. So e to e testing is just assuming that your whole, the entire application is just a black box. You don't care how many microservices are there, how do they interact with each other. There is a single input, then some magic happens, and single output. You check the entire business case. What are the benefits? What are the pros of e 2 testing, which I referred to? Well, first one is checking the entire business case. Those tests are loved by stakeholders and money people because uh, if someone asks you, how do you know your entire system works as expected? You, oh, okay, here, 100 of unit tests, another 100 of integration tests. I, I assure you everything is working just fine. He or she will not get it because I want to see the real scenario. I want to you know, purchase an item and I want to check that the credit card balance has, um, has been withdrawn. Uh, also, you can validate the crucial cases before deploying to production. Uh, if you are working on some system, there might be situations uh, when a stakeholder told you, okay, there is some case that brought us that bring us uh, the major revenue. You cannot break is whatever happens. You can uh, introduce new microservices. You can uh, introduce new databases. Do whatever you want, but this case should work every time you do any change to production environment. And e 2 e tests under these circumstances are very useful. You can set them and run every time you try to make any change to production. What are the disadvantages? What are the cons of e 2 e testing? Well, it's complex configuration, obviously. Uh, it's, uh, even with test containers, you will see later, it's not that easy to implement. And if you have only junior or, or even middle-level de develop um, QA engineers and you tell them, OK, here are, we have 10 microservices, just go on, write some in e 2 e tests, we believe in you, OK, I will, I'll be waiting. He or she won't succeed, I think. Uh, high entry barrier, so it's uh, actually is the first is the first point because not only you have to write those e 2 tests, you have to maintain them. It's also a problem. A long bootstrap and working time. Well, you you'll uh, get uh, why a long bootstrap is also a problem later, but working time, I think it's more or less obvious. If you have many microservices, then most probably your tests are asynchronous. You send some requests and then you wait for some time until the assertion succeed, and it will take a while. Parallel launching is tricky. Again, I'm not saying that it's entirely impossible to start e 2 e test in parallel. Of course, there are some approaches, and some of them I'm going to discuss with you later. But anyway, some e 2 e tests may contradict with each other. <clears throat> For example, <clears throat> one assumes that uh, the Redis cache should be empty at all, and another one assumes that there must be one particular record present. Well, 
obviously you cannot run those tests in parallel because they contradict each other and um, the result won't be deterministic and I think that not deterministic test is a really bad thing. If you have this, <laughs> fix that as soon as possible. Test logs are not enough. You have to examine services logs as well. If your A to E test has failed, well, what you can get from it? The assertion has failed. That's basically it. But I had five or six microservices. And what did actually go wrong? I don't know. I need logs of the services. I need metrics. I need tracing, uh, like we discussed in the previous uh, section. So all of these things have to be automated somehow, and it's also <clears throat> a big issue. Part two, what are the automation strategies? How can we run E2E tests on a basis? Well, the first one I called night builds of dev branch. Uh, how does it work? There is a developer. He or she creates a pull request from some feature branch and targets it to dev or develop branch. During this pull request, unit tests are being run, integration tests, maybe some static code analysis, etc. If everything passes, then we can merge it to dev branch and get, uh, um, take uh, the next issue to develop. Uh, separately, there is uh, E2E testing server that some, on some schedule clones the repository, check out the develop branch, and runs up the whole infrastructure, runs the E2E test, and then you can get the result. If everything is fine, you can create a new pull request from develop to the master or to the main branch. Uh, who of you guys actually apply such a similar strategy in their project? Raise your hands. Not so many people, actually. I thought there would be more. And now another question for those who raised hands. Who of you actually likes this approach in their project? <laughs> Only one hand I see. <laughs> so you'll get why, why I said this soon. What are the pros of this approach? What are the advantages? I have to name them as well. <coughs> well, firstly, it's easy to implement. There are a lot of complex things in software development, and if there is something that does not require many effort, then I think it's a huge benefit. And also, it's a well-known strategy for majority of developers. If a new developer is in your team, then you don't have to explain this complex scenario that you have built for your E2E test, because, well, dev branch, staging branch, testing branch, so everything is more or less clear. But there are a lot of disadvantages as well, and I think one cannot ignore them because, in my opinion, they are crucial. The first one is long response time between feature implementation and E2E tests. When I create a pull request, and if it's being merged, I'm not completely sure whether it's correct, because E2E test will be run like on the next day or in a few hours, so I, I have to wait. And I, those, this indecisiveness, it, it really, um, I, I don't know about you, but it really irritates me all the time. Bug fixing might be complicated due to code layering. What do I call code layering in this case? Suppose there are two features, feature one and feature two. You picked up feature one, you have developed it, you made a pull request, you merged it, everything is fine. Then you picked feature two, developed it, merged, and then after you have merged feature two, E2E test started to work, and suddenly you discover that feature one contains some bug. But here's the trick. Feature two used the code that you have developed in feature one. In that case, you have to fix the bug in that way that feature one is now working correct, but feature two is not broken either. That's a very simple scenario, but it could be even worse in some situation. And when I face it, I really <laughs> doubt myself being a developer sometimes. <laughs> uh, CI pipeline does not prevent possible errors. What do I mean exactly by these cases? Feature branch check out from the wrong base. For example, there could be dev, staging, testing, master, whatever branch, and you just check out the feature branch from the wrong base. I know this may sound ridiculous to some of you, but I actually seen such situations. There is a new developer coming to a team. There are six branches, and he or she being told, OK, pick up your task, make a feature branch, make a pull request. We'll see it later. What branch should I choose? Maybe it's staging. Maybe it's testing. Maybe it's dev slash uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.0.1. .0 I don't know. Well, he or she creates a pull request, everything is fine, it's been merged, and suddenly, boom, it's been merged to the wrong branch. 
and it's being deployed to the wrong environment, and we need to do cherry pick and all the stuff. We all love, you know. In Russian, there is an idiom for this: uh, uh, the pot stop boiling, stop boiling, stop boiling. But the process has already been started. Merging dev branch to master branch before test completion. That's the real case, actually. I did not come up with this one. What happened? There was a developer in our company. There was two branches, dev and master branch. He created a pull request from dev branch. He merged it, and then E2E test started to work after merging of pull request. And he thought, well, I didn't change much code. Everything should be fine. I didn't, I didn't have to wait until E2E test completion. I'll just make another pull request from dev to master. No one will notice. So, OK, that's fine. And guess what? The production went down because there was a bug, actually, bug, and he didn't notice it. And afterwards, I had a conversation with the tech lead of that project, and he complained to me, oh, this guy, he's so incompetent. We need you know, to do something about it. And I was asking myself, what's the problem with that guy? He did exactly what the repository allowed him to do. He made a pull request. He made another pull request. You approved it. So why do you blame him? Blame, blame yourself. Because you set it up the pipeline in so, um, in so particular way that it could be easily broken. So that's my opinion. Uh, maybe you think that I'm wrong, but we can discuss it later. <clears throat> What do I propose instead? So if dev and master branch is not that good, what do I propose instead? There is developer. He or she creates a new feature branch. But here is the thing. We have only one branch in the repository. It's master branch. So master or main, that doesn't matter. Uh, unit tests are being run during pull request build integration test and E2E test. So the main idea, when I create a pull request and all checks have passed successfully, E2E tests are also being run for this particular feature branch. So if I make a changes, so I create a service with these changes, and I test it with the latest version of all other services. When, when I merge a pull request to the master branch, I publish Docker image. So each time I merge a pull request, a new Docker image is being created. You can assign a git um, hashtag, for example. And I push it to Docker Hub, and it gives me an ability to deploy every pull request that has been merged to the master branch to any environment. So it could be dev, it could be staging, testing, it doesn't matter. I can just click one um, button in the CI pipeline, and that's basically it. So what are the benefits of this approach? It's a quick response before feature implementation and E2E test, because if something goes wrong, the pull request uh, doesn't build, and I see it right now. Incorrect code are not being merged and deployed to any environment in comparison to the previous approach. CI pipeline, in this case, prevent possible errors because, well, you cannot, there are not so many um, uh, options to make a feature branch. You have only one main, so create a feature branch from this base. The main disadvantage is how would you do it then, you may ask. Well, it all sounds so fascinating and believing, but <clears throat> how, how, can, how can I actually implement it in my project? And this problem is not a problem, because I'm here right now, and I'm going to tell you, finally, how you can do it in your project. I think you'll be waiting for this moment a lot <laughs> during my talk. OK, part three, implementation of E2E tests. What is the tech stack that I'm going to use? It's Java 17 for tests, GUnit 5 plus Spring Boot test. <clears throat> and again, I'm not advocating for using Spring Boot tests in general. You can use uh, regular GUnit 5 or Spoke or whatever you like. So it's just for convenience. And test continues, obviously, because it's also part of the talk. Uh, <clears throat> here is the suite. It's the base class for all tests that we're going to write later. So how does it work? Firstly, there is a Spring Boot test annotation, nothing complicated here, just to run the whole Spring context. Also, there are three additional bins. Uh, they are used to send um, uh, HTTP requests to access Rabbit and access um, Redis. So I'm not showing you the source code of these facades because they are rather simple. Really, they are nothing complicated there. But if you're interested, you can check out the repository later. Uh, then comes 
the declaration of container themselves. And you see there is a small detail. Usually when we work with test containers, we run you know, databases, uh, caches, uh, queues, and all the stuff. Here we have Redis and Rabbit, but also API service and gain service. So the business services that are part of the system that we are working on right now are also part of E2E tests as well, and part of test containers environment that we are going to configure right now. Uh, then context configuration is also a spring connotation. It's used as a callback. So this initializer is a callback that is being invoked right before spring context creation. So it will give us um, a chance to get some properties dynamically and override some properties also dynamically. And finally, network. So the network requires some additional explanations. You see, uh, there are four containers in our cases. So API service, Rabbit, Redis, and Gain service. They need to interact with each other somehow on the one hand. On the other hand, E2E scenario itself also needs to have an access to those containers because firstly, we want to send HTTP messages to API service. That's the entry point of our system. We want to consume messages from RabbitMQ because that's the output of our system. Besides, we need to have an access to Redis because we want to set up some test data before tests. And one way to achieve this is firstly, you apply the same Docker network to all containers so they can access each other. And also, you expose their ports to the outside world. So the exposed ports are accessed by E2E scenario, and the local ports are accessed as usually uh, within containers. So it's like Docker Compose, something similar to that. Here comes the code itself. It's going to be a bit complicated, so pay good attention to green rectangle. Firstly, here comes environment. Environment is just a spring bin to access properties that you can put in application properties or application YAML. Then we create Redis and Rabbit container. Let's have a look at Redis container first. Uh, I apply here a generic container because currently um, uh, test containers does not support a dedicated container for Redis, so just a generic container and uh, the required image. Then I expose port 6379 because that's the default port for Redis. Then shared network, so the one thing I just explained to you, and network alias. This one is crucial. Network alias is like a host name for container within this network. It means that other containers may access Redis by the name Redis, so or, or anyone you choose. Log consumer. Uh, Previously, I've told you that logs are also important because if something goes wrong, we need logs of service to understand, well, maybe some, there are some exceptions or warnings. And test containers provide a convenient API for this. You just provide a log consumer, and then you can pass a regular SL4J Java logger. So and underneath there could be logback, log4j, whatever you like. Uh, direct those logs to console, to file, to log stash, Choose whatever you prefer, so easy like a pie. Then comes RabbitMQ container. It's quite similar to the previous one, so, but here we have a dedicated RabbitMQ container. Uh, thank you, <coughs> test containers team, for that. Uh, shared network and network alias, just like before. I'm not stopping here. And with queue. With queue parameters means that this RabbitMQ queues will be created on container start. Why is that? Because when we deploy API service or gain service, then we usually expect that some queues are already present. Usually we do not create them programmatically. So in this case, I'm just creating them right after container is being started and log consumer as well. Well, finally, we have tuned Redis, we have tuned Rabbit, and then we should start them. So deep start method accepts var arcs of containers and returns completable future. So I'm calling join to wait until they are started. Why do I do that here? Because when we start API service against and gain service, we expect that Redis and Rabbit are already in work. So that's why I start Redis and Rabbit in advance. I'll make a small notice here. Uh, test containers support depends on clause. Just like in um, Docker Compose, you can set up so this container depends on that one. You can do the same thing in test containers, but this makes code less readable. So I'm not applying this technique here, but just uh, to tell you, it's also possible. Then here comes API exposed port. So this is the statically assigned port where 
uh, API service is being exposed to the outside world. You may ask, why do, why do I set this port statically? Because test containers can actually uh, choose this port dynamically. Well, I'll get to this point soon, but just to make it clear. Then comes API service and gain service. Firstly, let's see API service. So this is kind of huge. So <laughs> I tried to shrink it. Uh, so pay please good attention to this one. Firstly, uh, we read API service image from the environment. Why do we do it? Because uh, most probably tests code won't change as frequently as business services code. And we want to run the same tests for different versions of our service. For example, I made a new pull request, and it means that a new version of service is being created. I need to test uh, those things. That's why I pass API service just like a regular property. Uh, then comes generic container, obviously, because it's our some custom service. And then comes environment variables. Uh, just to make it clear, those environment variables does not correspond with test containers at all. It's just a configuration of the service itself. Uh, by the way, who of you guys pack their application within Docker image? Raise your hand. Why are there so less people? <laughs> I thought there would be more. OK. And another question for those who raise their hand. Who of you tune your application with environment variables? I expected everybody to raise their hand. <laughs> well, you see, environment variable is the most straightforward way to tune your Docker container, because you don't have to deal with volumes, with external files, you just expose an environment variable, and that's it. So if you don't use it for some reason, I strongly recommend you to reconsider your current situation. Anyways, let's go forward. Then we expose port 8080, because this service is written in Spring Boot, and 8080 is the default HTTP port. Shared network, OK. Network alias, OK. And here comes the magic. You see, uh, my first attempt was doing only those three statements. So I expose port, I set network, I set network alias, and everything doesn't work. So I just got IO error, and that's it. I, I came up to Stack Overflow with this situation then, where I was a guy who suggested me that I should assign the exposing port statically. And Finally, I managed to fix this, but still I don't know why is that. So I tried to dig in and I have failed. So if you know why is it happening for HTTP requests specifically, then I'll be glad to discuss it. But anyway, let's move forward. Waiting for. Test container need to know when the container is actually ready to accept requests. And here is uh, a nice API for it, so you just say, when slash actuator slash health endpoint returns code 200, then it means that the container is ready to accept requests. Pull policy. This one is very, very crucial, and it caused me a lot of pain in one place. You see, uh, by default, test container look for images locally. If it's present, OK, I don't need to go to the remote. That's logical. But images also may have latest tech. And as you may know, latest tech can be updated in the remote. And in that case, you will have an outdated version of latest tech locally. So I think you see where I'm going. Uh, I have faced a situation that my uh, tests were not right because they were tested on the wrong images. And the easiest way to fix that, you just tell test containers, always pull. No matter what, I want you to always pull the relevant image from the remote. That's not the best option, and I'll tell you why later, but for now, let's stick with it. And log consumer, OK, that's obvious, not stopping here. Gain service. This one is actually the same as the API service, as you may guess, so I'm not stopping right here because, well, I don't want to repeat the same text over and over again. But if you are interested, you can check out the source code later. Let's move forward. OK, we have tuned API service and gain service, and now we start them right here the same way. Set properties for connections. You see, when we started Redis Rabbit, uh, we exposed some ports to the outside world. But these ports are assigned dynamically, and we don't know them for now. But we need them, because we have to access those containers from tests. Well, we could theoretically assign those values to some static variables that, you know, it's not that elegant way. It's not spring way. So instead, 
we're going to override the properties. And those properties are accessible with a regular value annotation. So that's basically it. Uh, how does it work? You uh, click environment, get property source. At first, because uh, this properties has the highest priority, test containers, it's just a name. It, it could be anything, it doesn't matter. And map of the properties. So RabbitMQ address, Redis URL, and API host. Some of you may think, why do I need to assign API host? Because the port is statically bind, as we previously um, learned. And host should be all, always local host, isn't it? Well, actually, no, because test containers uh, allows to run containers on a remote host. And in this case, it won't be local host, it will be something different. Besides, there is also test containers cloud. So please don't assign local host statically. You will have an unpleasant experience for that. Always check out the actual host. Test itself, finally. And test is rather simple in comparison to the previous code snippets. So a regular class extends E2 ECUed, and then GUnit 5 test. What do we do? Firstly, we send some message to a slash API slash message, message in point. There are some cookie value and MSISDN. For those who don't know, MSISDN is a full number, actually. <clears throat> and then we wait for five seconds until this message is being transferred to RabbitMQ by gain service. OK, if that succeeds uh, as well, then we send another message. And notice, here is the same cookie value, but MSISDN is missing. Because I assume, as a QA engineer in this case, that the previous binding of cookie and MSISDN were saved. And if I provide just cookie, then it should be enriched. In that case, I expect that MSISDN would be the same. And this test, oh, and one important thing, you have to clear data somehow between tests because you want them to run deterministically. So the easiest way is just clean the whole radius and <clears throat> clean, reset all messages that you have already consumed in your test. Again, this is not the best approach because in that case, it's kind of hard to run your test in parallel. But anyway, it works for sequential runs perfectly. And if you run this on your laptop, <clears throat> everything is OK. So you may ask me, OK, you've shown us some pretty code snippets. We can run this in our IntelliJ, see a nice report. But how do we actually apply it within a CI CD workflow? And here comes the final part. Now we are setting up GitHub Actions pipeline and make those tests run on each new pull request. Technical stack is GitHub Actions and Mono Repository. Uh, so this, uh, <clears throat> this approach works for mono repositories and polar repositories as well, because in our team we are working with polar repositories. But I'm choosing mono repository because I don't want to provide you several links, <laughs> and it's uh, easier for me to get, my, to get my point. What are the pipeline stages? There are four of them. The first one is build. We just run unit, integration tests of API service and gate service, and build the artifacts. So nothing special or complicated here. Then comes build dev images. So what we're doing here, from the artifacts that were built on the previous job, we create Docker images and push them to remote Docker registry. Uh, the thing is, the tag of those images should be unique on each new pull request change, because we're going to use those tags on the next job. So we create some images, and then we run E2E test with, uh, with the provided images. And finally comes creating uh, images for production. So it's actually the same as dev images. So the only difference is that you run those job only when you merge pull request to master, because it's not so good to push anything on the tag latest when you just create a pull request. Uh, E2E test, as you have seen, is just a regular Java application, so it's quite convenient also to pack it within a, within a Docker image. GitHub Actions. Firstly comes build rules. They are trivial. You run it every time you merge a pull request and every time you create a pull request to master. Then comes the first step, build. So the name of the job, uh, Ubuntu or anything else, doesn't matter. Then there is a checkout step, so you clone the repository, you set up GDK 17, and run the Gradle command. Uh, honestly, you don't actually need to write this one by yourself because GitHub Actions can generate it. So you just click some buttons in the UI um, in the browser, and it will generate something similar to you. You just copy and paste it. 
Then comes build dev images. This one is rather complicated. <laughs> I didn't manage to put it within one slide, so please pay good attention to this one. Firstly comes build dev images. Uh, I set up that it depends on the previous one because I don't want it to run if if my unit tests have failed, then why do I need to create any uh, Docker images at all? And then comes outputs. You see, if you expose an environment variable in dev images job, it won't be available on E2E test job. Well, that's by design of GitHub Actions because those jobs theoretically may be run on different nodes. And even now, <laughs> you can find some strange implementations to overcome this issue on GitHub Actions market. For example, there is a GitHub Action that creates a file on some FTP server, and then you download this file on the next job. So it's a brilliant approach, of course, but now you don't have to do all this strange stuff because you can actually expose a variable like this, and it will be available on the next E2E test job. Then comes the step of the current def image, def images job. We check out the repository. We set up uh, Docker. We log into Docker Hub. Of course, you need to provide secrets in your repository. And then define an image tags. Firstly, I define a uh, def uh, uh, tag for my, um, for my Docker images that I'm going to deploy soon. And then comes this strange piece of code. You see, uh, if you expose a variable within one of these steps, it won't be available in the next step. So the isolation is not only between jobs, but within a step in a single job. But I need this variable because I'm going to push Docker images later. So GitHub Actions has also an approach for this. There is a special file called GitHub if You just add a new line here, and suddenly your, uh, <laughs> your environment variable is available in the next step. And this scary uh, row uh, is to expose this tag to the E2E test job. So this set, output, name, I just copied from somewhere on the internet. <laughs> Don't ask me why the syntax is so obscure. The second part of the dev images, uh, it's quite easy. All we need to do is just to build a Docker image and push it to Docker Hub. You see here I referenced the image tag I declared previously, and I have uh, Docker file for E2E test, API service, and gain service as well. You may ask, why do I need to update E2E tests? Well, it's obvious why do I need to update API service and gain service, but why tests? Well, as long as all these modules are placed within a single repository, I don't know what exactly have been changed when I create a pull request. Maybe I change API service and gain, and gain service and tests as well. Well, theoretically, you can determine this with Git index by scanning it, but <laughs> actually, that's a topic for another talk. Finally comes E2E test job, and on the contrary, it's quite easy. So, okay, um, the name of the job, it depends on the previous one. This code snippet means that we are inside the container, so the steps that, are, that you see below are run inside the E2E test container. And this container contains, contains tests themselves, we can just run them with change directory, run test, and that's it. Volumes. You see, uh, when you start E2E test, they also start containers, and they require Docker. But E2E tests themselves are also Docker image. So it means that you require Docker inside Docker. Test containers provide a nice solution for this uh, problem. You just need to assign a volume of Docker socket inside the container. So in that case, test containers will be able to run it on the host. So the <coughs> no complications here. And finally, steps. I remind you that these steps are run inside the Docker, uh, inside the E2E test. So what I do here, I just change directory to app and run E2E test. That's basically it. Build broad images, it's absolutely the same as build dev images, really. There are some uh, differences, like you push always with latest tech, but anyway, it's completely the same. So I'm not showing you the code, but here is the important part. We run it only during master branch building, because uh, we don't want to push anything under latest tech during pull request. Um, maybe it's wrong, so why would we do that? <coughs> If you create a pull request in this repository, you see those steps are being invoked. So the last one is skipped because it's just a pull request. But if I merge this, 
build port images are also being executed. If one of these fails, so I cannot merge my pull request at all. What is the potential problem for this solution? Long execution time, obviously, because if I run E2E test each time I create a pull request and there are many E2E tests, they run slowly, then the whole pull request is run slowly as well. What can we do about this? Well, firstly, containers usually start, usually containers start and takes more time than test execution does. In that case, uh, we know the containers start only once before testing process. It means that we need to make containers to start quicker somehow. How to make containers start quicker? Well, the first rule, independent containers should be always started in parallel. Please pay really good attention to this one. If you have many containers that you have to start in parallel as much as you can. If you start them sequentially, your tests will run very slow. Trust me about this. Also, beware of pull policy. Like I mentioned before, uh, I set up um, an easy example when you just pull every time a new image from a Docker registry. It's not efficient at all. Imagine that your Docker image uh, size is 500 megabytes, and you pull it every time you invoke your E2E test. And if there are several containers, of course, it will take a lot of time. So one of the approaches is to push a new image if it's a latest stack. Otherwise, you can just look out uh, in the local registry, and if it's present, that's OK. Also, test containers support options, option with reuse. How does it work? Usually, when you start containers with test containers, when your tests complete, containers are being destroyed and all, all, and all its volumes. But if you apply with reuse option, container will continue to work even when tests are complete. And when you start new tests, they will connect to the existing containers. So, of course, this will help you to increase uh, the speed of your test tremendously. But uh, be careful with this option. It has some drawbacks. I put a link. You can check it out later. How to, mess, how to make tests run quicker? Suppose that we have done everything to make our containers run fast. But still, our tests themselves run not that fast. Quick. What can we do about this? Well, firstly, put timeouts accordingly and use availability. Well, I, I hope everyone knows what is availability. I'm not describing you the whole benefits of this library. I'm just giving you a small, a small example. Suppose I want to wait for five seconds until gain service push some message to RabbitMQ, and then I check that this message is present. Here is an example with Fred Slip. Here is another example, almost identical, but now I'm using the availability. I wait for at most for five seconds until this lambda succeeds successfully. In this case, I will wait for five seconds no matter what. Even if gain service pushes the message within milliseconds, I will wait for five seconds because there is thread slip. But in this case, I will wait from zero to five seconds. Why? Because Notice this until function. It's lambda, and it's lambda is being invoked periodically. If it succeeds, then a utility assumes, OK, it's fine. I don't need to check it, so I just quit. If you have thread sleep calls in your test base, test code base, so please replace all of this stuff with a utility, and your, the time, um, the speed of your test will increase much. OK, what else can we do? We replaced all thread sleep with our utility, but still it's not that quick as it could be. So the last resort is actual parallel running. You, you can run your tests in parallel. In that case, of course, they will also run quicker. What are the approaches? Well, the first approach is you mark each message that are produced uh, in your test with some unique ID. And then you assert only messages with the specified ID. If you receive any other message, you just skip it like it doesn't exist. It works, but not for every case. Like I mentioned before, some tests may possess contradictory requirements. For example, one test assumes that the cache is empty. Another one assumes that there is one specific row. You cannot run them in parallel because one test will al always fail. Or not always, but usually. So the last resort is actually setting up parallel infrastructure. 
How does it work? Suppose you have 100 E2E tests. You just split the, them into two parts, 50 tests in each one. And then you run two processes, one with 50 tests, another one with another 50 tests. It means that each process possesses its own containers and do not interact with each other at all. Uh, if you have five containers and you split by two, then you have 10 containers. So it requires a lot of a lot of resources, but still it's, it's useful and it's easy. Uh, how can you do that? Well, if you are the JUnit and Gradle user, so you can apply JUnit tags for this one. So firstly, you configure Gradle like this. So you say that uh, you can include some tag specifically to run your test, and then you just start a separate process for each JUnit tag. JUnit tag is just annotation. You put it on your test class and that's it. So that's one way, but there are others we can discuss later if you want to. Conclusion, what have we learned today about this topic? Well, firstly, we have tuned an automatic E2E test running on each new change in a pull request. If you run E2E test during pull request build, then incorrect change won't be merged and deployed to any environment. They have staging, testing, whatever. The approach is applicable to monorepos and polyrepos as well. And e 2 tests are not so complicated as it may seem for you now. OK, as I promised, here is the QR code with the links to the slide. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them. No questions, or I just don't see hands. Well, I guess no questions, so thank you very much again, and have a nice evening.